Hello, my name is Victor Zberstis, and I'm on the team working behind the scenes on worldcommunitygrid.org, which has been harvesting spare processing time from computers, tablets, and smartphones around the world since 2004, putting these computing devices to good use while they would otherwise be consuming electrical power, just waiting for that next keystroke or mouse movement. One of the research projects on World Community Grid is the Help Cure Muscular Dystrophy Project from the Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris, France. Please let me introduce Dr. Alessandra Carbone, who will give you an overview and update of this project. Hi, I am um, Alessandra Carbone, uh, the PI of the Help Cure Muscular Dystrophy Project. This project uh, uh, has been run on a work community grid uh, in two phases. Phase one from December 2006 uh, up to June 2007 and phase two from May 2009 until September 2013, so quite a few months ago. So before starting giving you a, a plan of the project and telling you what did we find and what we probably will find in the future, so I would like to take a minute to thank all World Community Grid volunteers for uh, two reasons, in fact, for actively helping scientific research and projects like uh, HCMD in World Community Grid and also for having offered their computer time to our project. And uh, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, in both phases we counted more than 292,000 people. And uh, this is a good occasion for me also to thank the World Community Grid for providing the framework to help us uh, solve complex questions that uh, require a lot of computational power, like uh, for uh, our project. And uh, for me, these uh, possibilities uh, um, are extremely important. Uh, they allow us to think differently as scientists and pose new questions beyond limits that we could not uh, even previously envision. So uh, the Help Cure Muscular Dystrophy is a, a project that is aiming to study mu muscular dystrophy. In fact, that is a group of uh, inherited diseases with a genetic uh, origin in which the muscles that control movement progressively weaken. There are several forms of muscular dystrophy and uh, uh, such forms, uh, depending on the forms, uh, we have that not only muscles are affected but also other organs. The disease affects males and females of all ages and uh, uh, we, we should understand that uh, uh, the incidence is estimated to one per 1,000 head of population and this means that uh, it's not at all a rare disease. So the risk of a non-hereditary case is also possible and is approximately estimated to be one in 12,000. So what is HCMD about? So HCMD is a project that considers sets of proteins, human proteins in this case, and what wants to do is to study the relations between these proteins and ask two specific questions. In HCMD, we ask, first of all, where do proteins attach to each other the best? And then second, we are uh, asking uh, uh, which ones are the partners uh, of these proteins uh, in the cell. So uh, the, our aim is given a protein to look at how the proteins uh, interact with uh, any possible protein in the cell and then uh, select uh, out of this uh, ensemble uh, a few proteins uh, that we want to provide to the biologist to uh, study in the lab. So our aim is uh, to cut uh, out of uh, a thousand proteins uh, uh, in the human body uh, a few, a, a little dozen uh, proteins that the biologists can start and study in a specific manner. This is uh, an important step in uh, the illness, in the disease, and uh, I wanted to mention here that the type of information we shall provide uh, and con do not concern only the, the a small selection of proteins, but uh, for each uh, protein uh, interaction, protein-protein interactions, we are going to furnish also um, a type of a description of the kind of interaction at the atomic level. So why all this uh, is actually important uh, uh, for today's knowledge? So this information is uh, important in drug design, where uh, um, today the only knowledge on protein-protein interaction network uh, appear to be insufficient to think uh, about a safe uh, interaction of the drug with the protein. 
and uh, to reach uh, a given target we might think uh, about finding uh, new pathways in within the network of protein protein interactions and uh, we might think to target some specific protein and after a chain of interactions uh, uh, actually arrive uh, to the protein targeted that it's uh, important uh, to uh, control uh, for a given uh, uh, disease so uh, behind this uh, type of question, uh, there is an intrinsic complexity that explains the reason we are on World Community Grid. So uh, this uh, complexity is expressed by this uh, n square, where n is the number of proteins, and n square represents uh, the number of relations between uh, proteins that we need uh, to study. So uh, we, we need to realize that uh, if 100 is the number of proteins, the number of relations uh, is uh, 10,000. And uh, if uh, we have a thousand proteins to study, which is a much more reasonable uh, uh, number of proteins, then uh, the number of interactions that uh, we want to study is about a million. So if you count that uh, one single interaction might take uh, about a month of computing time in your uh, desk computer for uh, um, studying, then uh, 10,000 interactions would take centuries. And uh, a million uh, interactions, uh, well, uh, will ask you to, to ask <laughs> what to do with that. So this is why we ask for uh, help to World Com Community Grid. So uh, before uh, uh, giving you an idea of uh, the plan uh, that uh, let us, uh, um, let us uh, cut down uh, the uh, amount of uh, information that we need uh, to study uh, to try to solve our questions and, and to solve our problem, I would like to give you some uh, um, property of the type of objects we, st we are studying, namely proteins. So first, uh, I would like to say that uh, we know that a protein is a dynamic object. So what does this mean? Uh, if we take two proteins, like in the complex uh, that you see here in the screen, uh, formed by two given proteins, so the ge geometrical shape uh, that you observe, that uh, the proteins are taking uh, when uh, uh, they assemble, uh, the single proteins, you see them on the right and on the left now, uh, in their shape uh, once assembled, well, this uh, protein uh, shape uh, might have been different uh, before uh, the shape, uh, the, the complex uh, is taking place. So uh, here I want to add the molecular recognition mechanisms uh, are not known. The second property that, uh, uh, about properties and proteins that I want to uh, highlight uh, is uh, this one. So these properties uh, goes as follows. So um, if we wanted to study today uh, a human protein, so what uh, uh, we might uh, do is uh, to see how the same protein uh, is uh, found uh, in different organisms. And these uh, can help us to understand what is going on uh, in the human body. Meaning that uh, uh, the same uh, given protein, like dystrophin, but any others, in fact, uh, might be found uh, in uh, several other organisms like dog, monkeys, uh, uh, pigeons, uh, uh, at times uh, flies, uh, and uh, why not, at times uh, also unicellular organisms like yeast. So uh, once uh, we have uh, uh, the human uh, protein, if we want to study this, then we are going to observe by uh, looking at uh, yeast, fish and human sequences that uh, some of the protein uh, was actually lost, for instance, in fish and human. Some part of the protein was actually um, uh, gathered by human and fish and not uh, uh, present in yeast, and some part uh, becomes uh, uh, particularly conserved um, in um, the sequences, and because of this conservation we might uh, think that uh, if something is conserved then it should be necessarily important for the protein. So we shall exploit this information in the project. And uh, a third uh, property is the, the fact that the protein is a co-evolved object. What does this mean? Suppose that uh, you are considering two interacting proteins and that uh, on the, the interaction site there is uh, some amino acid that uh, is mutated on the surface of one of the proteins. Well, typically in evolution, we observe that uh, if the function has to be preserved, then uh, the amino acids that belong to the second protein that interacts with the one, and they, they are just in front of it physically, then they change also. 
So this is observed and we exploit this information as well. So uh, the logic uh, underlying the project uh, is the following. So we study protein docking through molecular modeling of a given uh, pair of interaction. We uh, predict uh, interaction sites based on conservation signals and physical chemical properties of residues that are observed across species. And we develop a numerical criteria for screening partners from docking outputs. And we combine this information with coevolution. So let me start with giving you an idea of what the algorithm, the docking algorithm, is about. So um, docking had um, a lot of success for protein assembly prediction is a known kind of family of algorithms. We developed a particular one to make uh, uh, possible to run on a world community grid a large amount of data. Uh, until uh, very recently, uh, docking demonstrated its uh, inability to discriminate protein partners. Uh, so what is the idea? Suppose to have uh, a sphere and uh, to place uh, uh, one of the two proteins that you are interested to study in the middle of the sphere. And uh, like the blue one you see in the screen. So uh, you take the red one, the red protein, and you put it on the surface of the sphere. Now, uh, when you do it uh, and you fix the position of the blue and the red protein, then uh, you are, what you are doing is to fix the face that the blue protein is showing to the red one and uh, as well as the face that the red one is showing to the blue one. Now, imagine that you take the red protein and you start to turn it around, to rotate it. And when, while you do it with respect to the same very face of the blue protein, you are showing to the blue protein many different other faces of the red one. Now, if you move the red protein along the sphere, but you keep fixed the blue protein, then what you are doing is to try to see uh, and to explore uh, new faces of the blue protein. You can do it by rotating again the, the red protein all around. And in this manner, you are exploring all the space of possible positions between the two proteins, blue and red. So the number of different positions we are actually exploring with our docking algorithm is about 300,000 for each given pair of proteins. And this depends on the size of the proteins. So what the docking is actually doing, really? Once uh, a, a position is actually considered over the 300,000, then the docking searches for uh, uh, optimal geometries of the interaction between two proteins. And what it does for this specific position is actually uh, to compute uh, an energy value, so an energy that, uh, a, a value, a numerical value, that uh, takes into account uh, the attractive and repulsive short-range forces that uh, belong to the two proteins, or the attractive and repulsive long-range forces, and also the charges uh, of the amino acids that are uh, on the surface, but also on uh, inside the given proteins. So uh, the type of uh, uh, energy function that we are using is uh, indicated below for the experts and uh, that they will recognize uh, a sort of uh, very simple uh, uh, energy function. Uh, what to do with these uh, docking uh, uh, algorithms? So what we do is to take a number of proteins and uh, to cross-dock them. So meaning that uh, we're going to, to take, for instance, four proteins and uh, we are going to uh, try to dock all of them against each other. And uh, given a protein, we dock it also uh, against itself. And for each uh, uh, analysis that, as I mentioned, take uh, 300,000 different positions to consider, we are going to select the best possible way in which these two proteins are going actually to, uh, in, to interact with each other. So we are going to create uh, uh, large matrices, like you see on the right-hand side, uh, where for each protein you have a value. 
And uh, uh, if you assume, uh, for instance, that uh, the blue and the green protein, or the orange and the, and the black one, are forming complexes, so real partnerships, then uh, you would like to, to find in the square, in the matrix uh, on the right, uh, where are the right partners. If you know them, then uh, you can recognize whether your method did it right. Otherwise, you have to guess what you find, and then uh, use that as a, an answer to your questions. So in this particular case, you see that all true partners that I have placed on the diagonal are actually um, highlighted by these red squares. What I wanted to mention here is that this cross-docking analysis uh, was realized in phase one over 168 proteins for which we knew the real partner. And in phase two, on uh, 2,246 proteins, these are human proteins that contain proteins uh, involved uh, in muscular dystrophy. And uh, for those, uh, we do not know the real partner, but we would like to find. So one important thing to, to mention before going on is that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, um, we had the good news in all this experiment about uh, the, um, the correct uh, description of our docking algorithm concerning uh, the protein uh, interaction, meaning that uh, it correctly describes how proteins interact. The bad news is that uh, energy criteria alone, as I was mentioning before, uh, turns out not to be sufficient for retrieving um, true partners. So we pointed out in 2008, uh, with a work realized on 12 proteins, that uh, the encouraging news was that energy uh, crossed with knowledge on the experimental interface could uh, actually let us detect in a precise manner partnership. So what does it mean, the, 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 the experimental interface? It means that we are uh, we're assuming that uh, uh, to know exactly where the two proteins are actually interacting. So uh, in phase one, we use experimental interface knowledge and uh, we uh, did the analysis on 168 proteins. The same analysis we have done on 12 proteins to see whether by scaling on 100 proteins, we could actually obtain the same type of effect. This was not clear at all, and the first part of the project was on a World Community Grid was important for that for us. We used a, a docking benchmark that was known, chosen by others, with uh, uh, that contained a number of proteins that were known to be difficult to, to uh, cross dock. And this is the result of the matrix that we obtained. As you see, you can recognize the um, diagonal. You recognize also with many white dots, uh, cells, you recognize that many of these interactions are recognized not to be interacting partners. And we were very happy with these results. These, uh, uh, we, wanted, we expected them, but uh, it was not uh, at all obvious that we would find that. So these results confirm that the precise binding site prediction method leads to a successful native partner identification. But the problem was, can we predict protein interfaces well enough to replace this knowledge on the experimental interface with predictions that could make the same work? And it's here that uh, uh, our knowledge that comes from evolutionary information enters into the play. And uh, we have done a lot of work uh, behind the scenes uh, that was not visible on the, by the members of uh, the World Community Grid directly on their screen. But uh, what we have developed was uh, a large scale automatic analysis of proteins that could allow us to detect, uh, to make predictions. Here on the top, you see predictions, and uh, below, the experimental interfaces of uh, given proteins. And these predictions were realized by using conserved positions and physical chemical properties. So based uh, on these uh, um, prediction analysis uh, uh, that could replace experimental binding sites, we can ask what are their direct implications uh, uh, of it that allowed to realize a phase two, made us convinced that we could go to phase two. So uh, there were two. Uh, the first implication is that we can restrict uh, uh, our docking search space 
and uh, uh, you remember the sphere if you have uh, a protein in the middle and you want to check the behavior of the protein on the surface well you can uh, uh, reduce the space of analysis of the entire sphere at a third of it so this is uh, an important reduction in space that uh, we uh, assured uh, would uh, allow us to find uh, essentially the same results so the loss of sensitivity uh, was minimal and uh, the second implication was uh, that uh, uh, this knowledge of binding site predictions uh, could make us uh, accurate selections of docked configurations so could uh, make us select uh, this type of docking configurations so those that had the binding interfaces just looking uh, at each other so this type of uh, um, selections uh, could make us then uh, construct these large matrices uh, I mentioned before and uh, there was uh, one more step that we had to introduce, uh, a step of normalization. So this is a step that I'm not going to explain in detail, but um, informally you can imagine that uh, um, this implies that the behavior of a protein in its interaction depends on the way the same protein behaves, not only with just uh, its partner but uh, with all other proteins. It's like uh, when uh, um, for humans uh, you say tell me who your friends are and uh, I shall tell you who you are. So for proteins is the same story. The principle we, uh, we applied is absolutely the same. We had to understand how the protein works always to understand how it works with its partner and to discriminate the partner. So um, for this uh, we systematically worked uh, with different type of crowded environment uh, meaning uh, subsets of uh, proteins that we changed and tried to study how a given protein behaved uh, with uh, different type of uh, partners and different type of environment so the question was does the protein recognize its partner in the same way in any type of environment Again, this is a not an obvious question. So uh, we found out uh, many things in this case, but uh, one definite thing that we, we realized is that uh, uh, the partner is definitely um, some uh, protein with which uh, a given protein might uh, uh, fit well, but uh, he's, he's not the only one. And typically all proteins uh, behave well, so they, they behave in sort of a uh, um, similar manner with uh, a small group of other proteins. So we decided out of these numerical evaluations uh, to consider these subsets uh, uh, to provide them uh, to the biologist, as I mentioned before, uh, as a result of uh, our analysis. So uh, phase one uh, finished uh, and today all docking data that have been obtained uh, by results uh, on uh, the computational work community grid uh, are available together with uh, all the data uh, that come from the analysis freely available uh, from our website and uh, uh, data analysis of phase two will come soon and this is uh, again uh, a data analysis on 2246 proteins of which 250 uh, belong to, um, to muscular dystrophy. On the methodological side, behind the scene again, we are working on coevolution for partnership discrimination and uh, we hope to produce a database of interactions for phase two over human proteins uh, and over proteins uh, involved in muscular dystrophy in uh, a year and a half, two years at most. So it's the end. I would like to thank the people that worked on this project. On the top, you see the colleagues with whom I could realize phase one and launch phase two, especially Sophie sakai -Mora. Uh, that uh, developed the docking program that ran on phase one and phase two. Uh, on the bottom, uh, those that were involved in analysis of phase one and uh, the development of the new concepts that will be useful for the analysis of phase two data. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to explicitly mention the role of my colleague, uh, Richard Lavery, uh, for its important role in a molecular modeling uh, uh, part that uh, made us uh, to run on uh, 
poor community grid, uh, the three biologies that helped us uh, to select uh, the right proteins for studying neuromuscular dystrophy and that are studying today neuromuscular dystrophy in the labs. So Pascal Guichnet, Anna Ferreiro and Giselle Bon. And uh, our colleagues uh, in the Laboratoire d'Informatique du Parallelisme à l'UNS Lyon uh, that helped us to bring uh, the algorithm, uh, the program uh, actually uh, on World Community Grid. And here you don't see them really on the screen, but uh, they are there. It's uh, the World Community Grid team and the World Community Grid members that I would like to thank again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carbone, for this informative talk about the Help Cure Muscular Dystrophy Project and how our idle computer time through worldcommunitygrid.org has helped with this project. We hope those listening are contributing and will encourage their friends to also contribute their spare computer power by joining worldcommunitygrid.org. We have time for a few questions. Our first question is, how many neuromuscular diseases are there? So, um, well, we can count uh, uh, about um, more than 60, let's say, uh, type of different uh, diseases or forms of diseases. Uh, we can find uh, uh, something like about 10, less than 10 that are uh, more uh, present. And, uh, but let's say there are um, less than 100, but about that's that number. Have cures been found for any of the neuromuscular diseases? No, unfortunately not. There is no treatment uh, that is currently available to stop or reverse uh, any form of muscular dystrophy. And then uh, instead, uh, there are uh, certain therapies and medications that aim to treat uh, the, the various problems that result for muscular dystrophy and improve also the quality of life for patients. You mentioned in your talk that um... Uh, most of the neuromuscular diseases are genetic, uh, except one in 12,000 were not. Are these contagious or some other form? No, they are not at all contagious. Uh, these uh, possibly these cases uh, are due to uh, natural mutations. So when we are born, uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, individually all of us uh, we have uh, uh, positions in our genome that uh, are mutated, and uh, it might happen that these positions are uh, happening in the same uh, um, genes that uh, are affecting uh, a, a person for muscular dystrophy, and then uh, you can have it uh, um, just by chance. How long would you expect it to take for your research to lead to some cure? So uh, we cannot ourselves arrive to the, lay, to the level of a cure, uh, as I mentioned uh, in, the, in the talk. Uh, and um, what we can uh, expect uh, is as soon as possible to, to provide uh, the subsets of, uh, uh, of uh, interactive partners uh, as potential interactive partners to the biologists and uh, providing to them uh, uh, information uh, on uh, eventually how to speed up uh, their, um, their own uh, um, tests on these proteins for uh, understanding uh, whether there are actually partners. And this would be really uh, already a lot of, uh, uh, of time saved for, uh, for the cure and uh, uh, towards the cure. And uh, it's clear that uh, um, the interactions with the biologies uh, is, uh, it's, uh, it's necessary. Are your techniques applicable to other diseases? Absolutely, yes. In fact, uh, uh, the type of approach can be applied to any other type of uh, genetic disease. Uh, I, I must say, genetic diseases may be of uh, many different types, but uh, those that uh, um, might, um, might depend on uh, explicit mutations, yeah? mutations of amino acids. Will you be working with some collaborators to make, uh, make use of your data when it is available? So the three persons, the biologists that I mentioned, uh, are of course interested to um, to, to to directly um, get uh, into our results. But uh, um, all the results, uh, and uh, as for phase one, uh, will be uh, published uh, on the web and will be available to all laboratories uh, uh, that are working on uh, muscular dystrophy proteins. Okay, well, thanks again, Dr. Carbone and those attending. Sorry if we didn't get your question, 
Please use our forums at World Community Grid to post any additional questions. This concludes our webcast.